you got to give me the skincare routine because you got some some pretty skin over there. I don't know if it's the light, but <laughs> I'm like, you got to let me know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my wife, my wife has been working on me. My wife's been working hey, on me. Tell her A plus. She's doing a great job. <laughs> <laughs> Stella, you just received an Emmy nom. Um, congratulations, number one. Thank you. How, how rewarding is that for you, uh, given your labor of love with the show? Oh my goodness, it's wild. Like I am I was sitting on a plane actually because I went to a game in Toronto to watch the Hawks. And as we're sitting on the tarmac, I my phone is like blowing up. It's my boss, it's one of my producers. I'm like, I either did something really good or really bad. And I <laughs> need to figure out why everyone at work is calling me. Um, so it was really nice. You know, they were calling to say I was nominated for this Emmy. It was a major like shock for me. I didn't know these things were coming out nor that I was even like up for it. So it was just really, really, really cool to see, you know, the work be received and people enjoy it. And I just, I felt very proud and very happy and super honored to be with this group of people that I respect and admire so much. So it's, it was exciting. You know, Taylor, I feel like um, interviews is, is, is too formal. What, what you're having are conversations and there's a, real, there's a real art to it. When did you fall in love with that art? Mm. I mean, honestly, I've always loved it. Like I've always really enjoyed people and learning about them in a very like real way. I've just always, always enjoyed that. I think a lot of that is my parents, like they're very warm, welcoming, you know, we're Southern. So we want to talk to everybody and, and get to know everybody. And I've always loved it. And growing up, my dad would like really make me do things like on stages or like talk to crowds of people. Like, cause he would always tell me I should not be scared of people. And I'm so happy that he did that because I really enjoy just like talking and asking questions. Um, and, you know, when I think about it, I just think about so much of how I grew up and how, you know, one day when I have kids, like how I'd want them to grow up. And it's so important that you really help like incubate the talents that your children have. Like a lot of the times, you know, if a kid is talking a lot, it's easy to say like, you know, be quiet and kind of try and silence them a little bit, but it, you have to like encourage that curiosity and like that want to know more. And I'm really thankful that my parents like pushed me to ask questions and pushed me to talk. So I never felt like these were, these were negative things. Like I felt like this is something about myself that I should, I should work on and continue to do. Um, and so I'm just very appreciative of, the, of them for doing that. That's amazing. That's amazing. So many key things that you said in there, um, but it all accumulates to you having this superpower now that you're, that Thank your you. parents are. Is that something you noticed along the way, given that, I mean, the number one fear for a lot of people is speaking in public, you know, yeah. you're talking in, 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 in uh, intimate situations as well. I mean, did you realize along the way that this is a, this is a superpower? Yeah, you know, I think this is something I always say. I think people have like their talent, but then they have whatever their gift is, you know? And I think that, you know, maybe the talent is like journalism or interviewing, but I think the gift is like making people feel comfortable, you know, or like being warm and being welcoming. I think I, I think people feel like they can trust me. And I just feel very lucky that I'm able to make the thing that I feel is my gift also my job. Um, but I think it really is like a superpower. I know we talk a lot about, okay, like knowledge is power, which it is. But I think that really knowing how to deal with people is one of the biggest powers you can have. Like if you know how to navigate rooms and you know how to connect with others, you learn what makes people happy, what makes them sad, what makes them light up. Like learning how to read a person, uh, I think is one of the, the greatest things that you can have on your side as you go through life. What are some of your favorite interviews slash conversations that you've had over your career? So many. I mean, like, I know it's cliche, but I love them all. Um, all your babies. <laughs> yeah, they are, literally, it's like choosing a child. No, um, I first want to say I'm always so just like thankful, you know, like, 
the fact that anybody decides that they will even sit with you, I'm thankful about, you know, like the fact that somebody says, I'll do this interview, I'm thankful for. So I'm so thankful for anybody that just decided to do an interview with me. But I think my interview with DeMar DeRozan always sticks out. Uh, now the interview I did with Candace Parker always sticks out. I really enjoyed that. I also like interviewing people that don't do a lot of sit down types. Like Jaw doesn't do a bunch and we've done like four at this point and he's always very open in them. Um, so I like that too. This wasn't on my show, but I got to like interview Barack Obama for eight minutes and I was like, this is the greatest thing ever. Uh, so I'll say Barack Obama. Um, but yeah, I think DeMar and Candace really, really stick out, especially because with DeMar, I was interviewing him at a time that you probably didn't want to talk to many people because he was with the Spurs. The Raptors were about to win the championship. You know, this whole narrative is like, they were able to get there with Kawhi. They couldn't get there with DeMar. Like there was just so many things to talk about. Um, and he was very open. And I think same thing with Candace. She was, she was really candid about the, her relationship or lack of uh, with Gino Oriema. And it was just really nice to really dig deep in those conversations. Yeah, um, yeah, she had some quotes. <laughs> yeah, like, yeah, it was like, getting hot. T was hot in that one. <laughs> I, know, I love that. You know, these things, you know, these these entertainers, these athletes, um, you know, as you know, and I'm sure you've been told a thousand times, them being open, it doesn't come by accident. You've mentioned the word warmth uh, multiple times. And I don't know that that's something you can teach. Um, that's something you, you have in you, there's an aura about you, um, you know, that, that great interviewers like yourself, um, conversationists like yourself has, have, it comes from being a, a good person with good intentions. Um, Thank you. I, 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 I talk about that with folks, you know, getting in the field and being a good person is just a, ba a basic thing that kind of gets lost totally. over. Yeah. Um, but on a human level, it's something that the people that you get to talk to, they connect with without even maybe vocalizing it. Yeah, I mean, thank you. I mean, I, I would hope so. I think the number one thing you can do in this business is just be good to people. Um, and that's not even in the business. That's just in life. I don't know why anybody would be the opposite of kind to a person. And I think that in media and maybe specifically with interviewing too, people know whether to believe you or not. You know, I think especially players, like they have gone their whole lives with people maybe having ill intentions or wanting to like catch them up in something or wanting to use them in some way. So I think it's very clear to them when somebody is genuine um, and just wants to get to know like who they are. And I think with interviews, like I genuinely never try to have like gotcha moments or get them caught up or like get a headline. I think that the best stuff just comes from being inquisitive. Like it just comes from asking why, you know, or having them expand on things. Um, I think that's like what's actually meaningful within interviews. So I would hope that at this point I've created a space where people understand that I might have to talk about something like I don't necessarily want to, but I'll talk about it in a way that I am being heard not in a way that I'm like being judged or being tricked. Um, and I think interviews really are better when it is that way. And a lot of that does just spur from like wanting the best for people, wanting to be kind to others, wanting them to have good experiences with you and with your show. Um, so that is absolutely the goal. So I'm, I'm very thankful that you, you feel that way. Taylor, what has been the toughest part of this business um, or the yeah. most trying part of your journey? Mm, that's a really good question. Most trying part or toughest? I think I'm, I know I'm much better at this now, but you certainly deal with feeling like you're consistently having to prove that you deserve or like, or that you're good enough. I think that when you're really young, and for me, I always say, I think my life moved like really quickly. Like right when I graduated school, I was working at Big Ten Network. So I'm like this 21 year, year old doing this live show five days a week. And I was kind of thrown into the fire, both at work, but then also like personally, like what it means to be like a journalist and like this public facing person. I think sometimes when you're young, you're hearing people like say things about you that maybe you like don't agree with, but you hear them so much that you're like, is this true? And you second guess who you are sometimes. And I very like quickly had to learn that like, 
knowing who you are at your core is like the most important thing that you can know because it can be very trying when so many people are trying to tell you who you are and you're like wondering whether that's right or not. Um, so I just think, yeah, I would say, I would say being able to cancel out what anybody has to say about you is like, the number one thing you have to be able to do because that can be difficult having to hear about yourself all the time if that makes sense i don't know if i explained that correctly but oh, no. it's 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 absolutely true and it happens on you know on different levels and as your star has grown i'm sure it's gotten louder and louder and that's you have to put those earmuffs on and as you yeah. said you are remember who you are mm -hmm. um there's so many you have to to navigate through you know in this industry i um I heard, I heard uh, uh, you mentioned this in an interview once and somebody told you, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. Yeah. And that, that reminded me of a story when I was in Indiana, I was doing, I was a key announcer for the Pacers. I was doing a radio show, I was doing wow. TV. And I was- So you were I doing was, everything. <laughs> everything. Yeah. I wouldn't say that I was feeling myself, but I was feeling pretty good. You know, I grew up in Indianapolis and here I was, you know, doing these different things. And I remember it was before a Pacers game, I'm walking on the court. And Quinn Buckner does TV for the Pacers, and he called me over, and he says, "No, you do some pretty good things, young buck. But you got to pick one." And I, that just kind of hit me, like, "Wait a minute, I'm doing everything. Like this, who does everything? Who does all these different things?" But he was he was giving me a lesson then that it, it took me a little bit to for it to resonate um, to narrow that focus uh, a little bit. You can still do multiple things, but narrowing. Yeah. The focus. Important. How did that, you can do anything, but you can't do everything. How did that resonate with you? Oh my gosh, in so many ways. And it's like, I mean, you know, I think we have this, we have this idea that like, we have to be able to do it all, like to be worthy almost. Like you want to say like, I want to be irreplaceable. So if I can do this, I can also do this and I can do this and I can do this. But there really is a power in learning the thing that you're best at and like trying to hone in on that specifically. Like being the best at that thing um, is really, really important. Obviously you still wanna be versatile. If that moment comes where somebody does ask you to do radio, you want to have the ability and capability uh, to do that. But if you say, no, you come to me to do this and you perfect that, I think there really is just like something important about knowing what you are great at, honing in on that. And so, yeah, when someone said that to me, I was like, well, what do I think is, what's my lane? Like, what can I excel at? Um, and I realized the thing that I thought I could excel at was also the thing that made me feel the most purposeful, which was having these actual conversations and focusing on interviewing specifically. Like I didn't feel as fulfilled, like doing sideline. I didn't feel as fulfilled, like hosting i think those are obviously like amazing things to do but i was like i don't know like am i am i like a host in a way of like being with others and facilitating or do i just like want to ask questions and talk for an hour and for me it was the asking questions thing so i really tried my best once i realized the thing that made me feel fulfilled like making sure every decision i made like was on that trajectory and i do think when you know the thing you're good at you make decisions to be able to do just that but if you can do everything or if you're doing everything, that path is so scattered because you can go in so many different directions. And I just work better when I have like a, a very specific plan um, that I want to make decisions towards. You know, you're, you're interviewing, you know, all these amazing people and, and these, you know, celebrities, but um, you have become just as recognizable as the people that you're talking to. Um, do you remember when that moment was when you, Notice you're being recognized, your people are complimenting yeah. your work. Yeah. Um, I always say, like, the thing I think about is it was All Star in Charlotte. Like, what was that? Maybe like four years ago? Maybe like three, four years ago. But yeah, I was All Star in Charlotte. And like, Dreamville did an event. Um, and I went to it was like a brunch or something. 
And I went to it. I remember J. Cole had seen my interview. And I remember thinking, oh my goodness, J. Cole's seen an interview? Like, I'm such a big fan of J. Cole's music. Um, and so that was like a wild moment for me that I always like think about, like, this is insane that he has seen it. Um, but it's always, I love whenever, like if I'm on the street and someone says, you know, I really enjoyed this interview or I like what you do. And I will sit and have conversations like, what did you like about it? What didn't you like? Because I think talking to the viewer about it is important too. Cause you know, you want, you want to ask questions that the viewer wants to know. That's the whole point. Um, so I'm just, I'm really appreciative of anyone that has watched an interview, even if it was for one minute. Um, it just, it makes me happy that the work resonates with people. It's, it's amazing. I, I grew up and was watching inside stuff with Ahmad Rashad. He was an athlete himself and he brought the human element out of these NBA players that he was interviewing. Also understanding that their life is 24 seven basketball, yeah. but they care about other things outside of the sport. So being able to connect with them on a human level on other interests. And, you know, it just really inspired me watching what Ahmad Rashad was doing. We talk about, I talk about representation a lot on, on this show, knowing that, I don't know how often you think about it, but you're having an impact that, you know, people are watching or young people watching and seeing what you're doing and saying, I want to do, I want to do that. You know, how, what does representation mean to you? I mean, I, I think representation really is everything in so many different ways. Um, I read this book once called Heavy by Kiese Lehman. That's like one of my favorite books and he's like my favorite author. But in it, he talks about how, you know, growing up, he could turn on any show, whether it was a soap opera or if it was like Price is Right or if he was watching sports and he saw like white men that were coaches, he could turn on anything and he could see white people. But not only could he see white people, he was able to see all different types of white people. White people were very heavily represented to him. But what he argues in the book is that representation, the way that it's important for people that look like you, it is almost as important for people that don't. Like we have to show that black people are not a monolith to people who maybe don't have black people right next to them in their everyday lives. So I think the responsibility I have is to people that look like me, specifically black women, you know, black men. But I think it's also important to show who we are to people who don't know, because we don't have, unfortunately, that wealth of options that we see in the media of black people. Unfortunately, a very specific picture of black people is painted a lot of the time. Um, so I think it's, it's just very important to show the wide array of blackness, the wide array of black people, whether it's their interests, the way that they have grown up, you know, what they're into, what we'd like to watch, what we do, like that's very, very important to me. Um, but I would, I would also say to any like young black woman that wants to do this, that we are truly exactly alike. Like I think everybody is the equal amount of special. I don't think that I am more special or more talented than somebody that isn't doing this. I think that I have had things on my side. I have had advantages. I have had advocates. I've had a lot of luck. Um, I think everybody's value is incredibly constant and everybody's value is the exact same. So I think sometimes when we're young and we're looking at people that look like us doing the thing we want to do, we think it's because they are more special than us. And that then makes them feel like, like it makes them feel like what you're doing is unattainable. That actually isn't true. I am an incredibly attainable person because I am exactly like everyone else, right? So I think that's that's the main thing that I think about, about representation is just like, everyone is the same. Like I want every black woman to feel like they can do everything that they see every other black woman do because that really is the truth. And I, I just to, to piggyback on what you're saying, um, I also love seeing, and I think it's, I think a lot of people enjoy seeing everybody cheering each other on. And yeah. I, it, this, this media is kind of dog eat dog and only so many people can be in this space. And if there's multiple, you have to be competing and you have to be going head to head and there has to be discord and dislike or whatever it may be. But to see, you pumping up someone else or, or enjoying time out and, you know, group pictures with people who are all in the same industry and showing kind of that love that 
that sisterhood, that whatever it may be. Um, uh, I, I think that that's huge. I think that that's huge also. Yeah, no, for sure. I mean, it honestly makes the job more fun. Like, I love <laughs> being friends with people in the business. Like, I don't believe in this idea of like, it has to be cutthroat. I can't talk to you because I want to get this interview. I'm like, that is so stupid. Like, there really is room for everybody. And I think sometimes the, the issue is the systems that are in place. But since we're all a part of that system, it tricks us into thinking that the person across from you is the issue. But really it's like, no, there should be room for multiple women at this station or multiple black people. Like we, you end up fighting each other when you should be fighting whoever is making like these, these decisions, if that makes sense. So I don't see any of my peers as somebody that I should not enjoy or be friends with or root for. I, Cause I just want eventually there to be a time where everybody knows there is more than enough space for all of us to, to coexist. And I know we talked about interviewing the conversations and whatnot, and we started with your, you know, the Emmy nomination. Uh, what is the most rewarding part of your podcast? Mm. <laughs> I've never been asked that. It's a good question. Uh, the most rewarding part of the podcast. I think it's two things. Um, I think number one, I take a lot of pride in being a trusted person for athletes who I'm sure feel like they can't trust people. Like I take a lot of pride in people sitting in that chair and thinking they can talk about things they maybe don't want to. So I think the, the trust aspect is very rewarding for me. Um, and then secondly, I like, I love nothing more than when somebody is like, I've never said this before, but, and then they start saying something. So it's rewarding for me too, when like people get to like reveal things, right? There's like a moment that happens on it that nobody knows that always like really makes me happy. Cause you know, like that's a point of interviewing. You want, you want them to say something that they haven't said. So I just, I like that people feel like they can talk about things. Maybe they haven't um, on the show. And, you know, I'm excited about watching you throughout the NBA playoffs and, and every time those interviews drop, really looking forward to it. I know this Thank is kind you. of a clear on this, but what is next? What does the future hold for Taylor Brooks? Oh, my God, I hope so many things. You know, I want, I want it all. I want to be able to interview whoever I want. If you have something to say, like you think about doing it with me, um, that's what I want. I think that for, for me, the future is like, it's a feeling and a concept. It's like, I know what I'm going to get when I watch her interviews. Like I want, that's like what I ultimately want to do. You know, there's so many things I like need to get better at and want to get better at. There's so much room to grow. There's so many like things I don't know about sports that I want to learn more about. I want to push myself to do more in interviews. I really want to do a live interview too. That's something I've been talking about. Um, so there's a lot, like, I just think, for everybody, all the opportunities are endless. So I want to, I want to grab things as they, as they come my way and just, just keep getting better. Well, it's been amazing watching your journey and, uh, and all that the future holds. Thank you so much. Appreciate you, Taylor.